Well, good morning, everyone. I really appreciate everyone coming out on a early Saturday morning, especially after the party last night. Um, uh, we're going to um, speak from the table, and um, so, and um, we're we're going to keep our remarks pretty short so that um, you all can ask questions and we can have a good discussion. So I would encourage people, you know, if you, if you want to, move over on this side of the room, but if you don't, that's fine too. Anyhow, my name is Angela Campbell. Um, I am a um, law professor and public interest attorney from Washington, D.C. Uh, and I've done a media work for over 20 years and first got involved in privacy work mm, about 10, I don't know, with Jeff. Media <laughs> reform champion for decades, providing the key free legal assistance that's made a lot of, uh, uh, Angela Campbell is really one of the great heroes of the media reform movement, tirelessly dedicated uh, to supporting legal action at the FCC and elsewhere, helped develop the strategy that led to uh, the successful uh, overturning of the, media, of the of Michael Powell's FCC rules and many, many more. The Institute of Public Representation has done incredible work and Angela deserves our thanks. Jeff knows how to embarrass me, but oh, thank, well, thank you. Uh, it's going to be hard to introduce uh, you. you know, we really have a fabulous panel here. All right, so we're going to start with Jeff Chester, who is also uh, an, um, an amazing person um, from media reform, uh, who has just really become the expert on how all of this behavioral tracking and advertising, the whole uh, ecosystem works. And um, so we're going to hear from him first. And then we'll hear from Lily Coney from EPIC, the Electronic Privacy Information Center, which has been also um, really is the premier um, privacy public interest organization. And um, she's spoken at several conferences before, I believe. And uh, finally, well, not finally, uh, Guilherme Rochke, uh, he, he works with me. He's an attorney, but also worked at EPIC. And, um, has an amazing knowledge as well of, of on, and able, and hopefully one of the things we'll be able to do is to really sort of answer your questions to explain how this all works and why you should care about it. Um, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that are going on in Washington and opportunities to get involved in policy. So I'm just gonna turn it over to Jeff to get started. Thanks very much, P appreciate this Angela and appreciate the uh, um, a free press for um, in, inviting us, and I'm going to ask Guillerme to uh, uh, give me a two-minute warning. I'm going to quickly walk you through some of the key issues around online marketing. <clears throat> this is really about the future of media in the United States and all around the world. Uh, powerful forces are shaping uh, the communication system. And if you ask me if, uh, to, to show you what the media landscape ownership system really looks like today, this is the slide I will show you. These are the companies, and Facebook and Google are part of them. These are the companies that have, over the last decade, uh, but certainly the last few years, created the business model, the practices. And it's all about an intense, personalized data collection system, tracking you wherever you go, analyzing what you are, in order to turn that information over to advertisers and marketers. And this is also reshaping how editorial content is being created. We've witnessed incredible consolidation in this digital marketing um, uh, data targeting uh, complex over the last a few years, and I could show you the one in mobile in the last uh, two years, and we've been fighting all this, but Google and Apple bought the leading online mobile ad networks, AT&T, T-Mobile. It's not about selling you uh, uh, subscriptions for phones. It's about all the money to be made in mobile marketing and mobile advertising over the next few years. So this issue, I mean, I think it's, it's interesting that Free Press saw it as a privacy issue, because it's not. It's, it's about much, much more. It is the fundamental glue, fundamental forces reshaping the entire media system. It is about over-commercialization. It, it is ultimately about human rights. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, it's about shaping our identities. And uh, it really also links to what can progressives and media reformers do to create sustainable business models in this new era where generating revenues based on who you're able to target, particularly those most influential and, 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 and financially 
secure uh, consumers is going to have a big impact on content. Um, so over the last 15 years, online advertisers, Google and others, have developed what they call behavioral targeting. It's a far-reaching uh, system uh, across applications and, and all platforms. If you look at what the online advertisers and the, on the online publishers, Google, the New York Times, all of them are doing, you can go to the Interactive Advertising Bureau, which is like the new NAB or the NCTA. The IAB is really the power structure for the digital media industry. They are creating the standards for how all media uh, operates. And it's all about um, um, uh, very, very intensive targeting, and, and multicultural communities are certainly in their in their screen. C companies like Microsoft have developed laboratories for behavioral targeting. It's based in Beijing. Yahoo's is based in Bangalore. Google has them all around the world. This is a highly uh, intensive system of data collection for individual uh, targeting that's shaping content. And this is, for, this, except for the headline, marking through the social graph, this is from Facebook's actual media kit they give advertisers. And what Facebook tells bigger advertisers, the biggest advertisers, will, really tells you where Facebook is going because they tell the biggest advertisers of the Fortune 1000 we can really deliver individuals and what do they say they sell? They sell you. They have this is actually from their media kit. I have your identity. I have you across platform. I know who your all your friends are, and I can target you in, in ubiquitous ways. And of course, mobile is of course very new. It's a major privacy concern. It's going to be the dominant medium here in the United States. It's already the dominant medium in. Um, in Asia Pacific. And the problem with mobile, as you know, is that's merged the behavioral targeting, the data collection, the tracking that we see on the online web with your location. So here's a, here's a company that uh, uh, is uh, recently gone in business. I, if you can't make it, you can't see it, I'm sure you can see it better than I, uh, this is just one of the leading companies. And it says, we use mobile phones as always on sensors, creating a full 360 view of people's mobile consumption. We track both their online and offline usage, capturing data points, applications, et cetera, et cetera. So far reaching commercial surveillance system is at the heart of the new media system. And it's not just mobile phones, new technology, uh, tech Technologies have really advanced over the last few years, and one of the things that I think is, is very important and very disturbing are the technologies that now sense the content that you're on. And it senses the content that you're on, not just so it can insert in real time, very targeted advertising that works well with that content. Of course, the content's going to increasingly be changed to individuals based on what they think will, will sell, and they already have that technology. But what you're seeing online now in, in the digital media is what we saw in television, and where advertisers are, are demanding they want to have, quote, brand safety. And I urge you to go and do a search for brand safety. And you will see, this has far-reaching applications, because what this means is that the major advertisers don't want to monetize a diverse array of content, and content is increasingly getting uh, blacklisted. Um, it, over the last two years, uh, one of the most disturbing aspects has been the, something called real-time ad exchanges. Individuals are now auctioned off in 20 milliseconds to the highest bidder. So let's say you're on the New York Times site, New York Times happens to get, is operating its own ad exchange, but let's say you're on Yahoo. Yahoo will say, Joe or Jane, I know a lot about them. I know what their online uh, uh, activities are. I'm able to instantly integrate offline databases into that targeting profile. Who will pay me the most to target Joe or Jane? You can see this is not just advertising as we know it. It learns about you. And ad exchanges, this auctioning off of individuals, which I find dehumanizing, is now the most important, powerful uh, uh, technique online. It's developed here in the United States, but it's been exported already into Europe and Asia Pacific. This is not advertising as we know it. It's not just about data collection, right? You know, yes, data collection is woven into the entire system, but it's, 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 it's using very powerful interactive applications to in, in, uh, foster and, uh, and uh, solicit information so, it can, so people can be uh, uh, targeted. Uh, this, by the way, is just an example of uh, a mobile auction. Uh, I like it because I, I used to live in San Francisco. So someone's walking the streets of San Francisco, and two fast food companies bid for the right to place the ad on their mobile phone. <laughs> While the, uh, the new online ad exchange system uh, uh, is said to help publishers right now, in fact, people who are making the most money 
are the new uh, data brokers, the people I showed you in the first two slides. Once again, these are not ads that just appear. These are ads that learn about you, can be transformed in instant real time. Yahoo calls them smart ads. Google just bought uh, a company, Terrasend, that does the same thing. So it, you can tr it can have 1,000 or 2,000 different variables as it, as it follows you and learns about you. One of the most disturbing aspects of the current digital media system is uh, the surveillance uh, from Facebook and other social media. This happens to be uh, PepsiCo's control room uh, for social media for one of its uh, uh, brands. But the Fortune 1000 and many, many other people have unleashed a, uh, an array of technologies that can effectively track you on your social media, analyze what you do and the flow of communication you have with others, and then there are both uh, there are then applications that can be deployed. And politicians are doing this, big corporations are doing this as well, and it's very disturbing. But they can say, "I know that you are influenced by." your friend over here, I will send a special message to your friend because I know I can target them as quote unquote an influencer and then change your behavior. Pharmaceutical companies, politicians, financial companies are all using these new technologies. There are, the, the online media companies have paid a special attention to the growth, we're almost ready, of, of, of multicultural groups. This, just, this is a behavioral targeting uh, warehouse. I can target African Americans, I can target Hispanics. Uh, Etc. Neuromarketing, they're using the most, go to neurofocus.com, advertisers not only just collecting a lot of data about you, but they're using very advanced techniques to create the ads to, that will appeal directly to your unconscious, this is this digital, uh, there are policy issues which we'll talk about. We've been fighting this, we've been sounding the alarm, we've been fighting this, we've been working with Epic and, and Angela and, and others, and I think we've had a big success. We helped put this privacy issue on the map with, with Epic, etc. But more is to be done. Thank you very much. Setting up um, for Lily, uh, anyone has a uh, burning question for Jeff? Okay, and the third row there, please, green sweater. Oh, yeah. That was so fast, it was wonderful, and I'm wondering whether or not you have that information anywhere else that we you know, can access yes, it? Yes, we do, and, and, and it, was at the it was at the last slide. You know, if you really want to get a case study of how this is done in one particular area, go to digitalads.org, which is a site that I, I curate, and that's just junk food targeting kids. And there's great reports and research there, and all, but look at but all the examples, and it will give you nightmares because when you see, but when you think, hi, when you when you see junk food, think about pharmaceuticals, think about financial products. If you go to democraticmedia.org, and you, uh, which is my other website, and you plug in. Um, subprime or plug in uh, uh, pharma, you will see our filings and other materials because, because you know, the, a lot of the subprime loans were sold using these techniques, for example. They identified who was poor and they were able to get them online. So yes, it's all there, democraticmedia.org and digitalads.org and hopefully more will be coming. But this has been an underappreciated issue among the progressive community. I think much, to, frankly, to our uh, 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 our, our fate, our future f uh, fate, and I think one of the goals here is to create s sustainable, responsible business models. Everything is going to be commercial. You, you, you know, if you, do, you haven't seen what's about to happen. If you're tracking online video, if you're tracking social media, we're going to have a much more commercial system. And the question is, can we? How do you, how do you survive in a system that's basically all commercial? And how do you do it ethically? And I think there's frankly room to do it. And if you want to see how to do it bad, go see what Huffington Post is now doing now that it got taken to AOL. Go to AOL advertising and click down to see how they target African Americans, how they target Hispanics, how they target teens without informing them what's really going on. And here is the ever uh, 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 delightful Lily Coney. Do you see it? Okay. I think we had a question in the front row here. No? Oh, I had a question, but that was my question. 
Yeah, we only have two. Can, can you um? Can you take the mic over so he can ask his question <laughs> over here? <laughs> yeah, but they, it didn't get recorded. Is the problem? Yeah. Hi. I. You you outlined the problem. Yeah. Effectively, right. what's the solution? All right. We have made uh, with allies. We have made a series of interventions. That, and the reason this is a privacy panel and not an online marketing panel, and it should be an online marketing and the future of digital media panel is that one of the few places where we've been able to intervene, and I started intervening back in 1998 when my wife and I got the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act passed, which regulates data collection for kids under 13. It was the only law we could get passed at the time. Cutting off the data is a key. Cutting off the automatic collection of the data for the targeting is key. And what's happened is, because of Epic and because of CDD and, and others, we have helped put this whole issue in play. And Angela will talk about it because the Europeans play an important role. So cutting off the data, going after the, 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 the bad practices, going after neuromarketing, going after multi, we, we got, we, we, we got uh, con in Congressman Rush's bill, we worked with him, it's not gonna pass, but we got uh, racial and ethnic identity listed as a sensitive data point controlled by the individual because one of the things that I felt were most disturbing about the system was they're, they're identifying people's race and never saying, so they know the race, the economy, where you, I mean, how much m money you make, where you live and all that. All right, so uh, should we move the, uh, maybe we should go to gear mate. Well, we, or, no, no, it's not. Uh, so, so there's, a, so, and we filed complaints. So right now the FTC is investigating, for example, uh, what the big drug companies and the health companies are using in terms of digital marketing. One of the great things that did happen, I have a lot of, I have problems with how the Obama administration's handling this, but as a result of our activism, the Federal Trade Commission appointed uh, as its Director of Consumer Protection, David Vladek, who for 25 years ran Public Citizens Litigation Group and is the real deal, and he's a colleague of Angela and Guillermo's. And while we have him there for the next year, we can make things happen at the FTC. They also appointed Julie Brill as a commissioner. Some of you may know her. She's from Vermont. She's, a, she's also a, um, a progressive. So uh, we're, we're making things happen at the FTC. We're making things happen in, at, the, at the EU, and we're trying to drive, them, drive the industry crazy. And I have to say, we're having a very, we're having a lot of success. Two years ago, the online advertisers denied there was even a privacy problem. Today, they're spending you know millions of dollars to create new forms of uh, flawed self-regulatory uh, initiatives to head off what will be legislation and regulation eventually. But it doesn't answer the question of what progressives do and what the media reform people do, because you're, we're we're going to be further marginalized in this system. I'm afraid. Why? Because they've created the business models and they have populated the system first, and they have you, they have tremendous advances uh, now. Into yeah, I hope it's going to work now. All right. All right. Okay. Technology, right? Okay. I I disagree with Jeff only on one point. I think, well, Epic believes this is all about privacy because let's face it, it's you all the information about you that makes this new way of marketing and selling possible. So that's your personal information, which makes it privacy, and that's why Epic is in this fight. I wanted to start off by reminding people that history repeats itself. And so I think the closest model to what the world is now on the internet is probably the, at the era when we first had radio. Anyone who wanted to have a radio station could have one. It, right now, anyone who wants a web page can have one. You can get access to content. You can be content consumers. You can get content uh, producers. You have a great deal of influence over your network of friends. It's hard to really influence people if there's so many influencers out there. The model that we're looking at transitioning from is a model where the influencers were, you had three major networks, uh, then it was four, but they provided you with all the data, the information you would ever know about and be able to shape your ideas and your feelings about the world around you. But the difference was it didn't collect anything on you. You looked at the television set, it didn't look back at you. You listened to the radio, it didn't look back at you. I took a brief look to see at the history of radio and I found some interesting things. Some of you may already know this. But up until 1912, radio stations weren't 
regulated. Regulations begin in 1913 with uh, the FTC. Then the U.S. entered World War I, and then all the radio stations were taken over by the government. And then after World War I, all the stations had to reapply, had to submit licensing again, and you sh saw a very short list, and over time it grew and grew. It was thousands of stations. And privacy was good in this environment because no one was collecting any information. What happened in your home, nobody really understood or knew about. They didn't know what was going on in your head unless they did surveys. They had to do surveys with thousands of people to try to get a, the understanding of what the census, a sense of what the population thought or felt about things. Flash forward to the internet. The internet was actually a government research project. Most of you may know this, but the whole idea of being able to ship data around in an un um, traceable way came out of a Defense Department uh, program. And so by 1972, the first email program, Internet Society was formed by 1993, and the highest speed, the, the top speed they thought uh, at the time was 44.736 um, megabits per second, uh, T33 line, which is uh, laughable today. But anyway, that's where we were. Internet hosts balloon. They grew by hundreds of thousands of hosts by 1993, and it was impossible for any government agency to actually regulate or manage the Internet. So they basically pushed it off into ICANN and, and pretty much let the, the thing grow on its own. But the whole notion that th it has developed into a platform where business, commerce, government, and individuals all are living, literally, a new way of fa forming communities and relationships and that marketing, the, the monetization or the commodification of individuals is going on every day. It's, it's incredible that this is happening, that we are revisiting another chapter in, in human history that we, we thought we understood not to do that, do that ever again. But the, ho the attraction of how much money can be made makes it very important for people to be aware. And we've been fighting to raise awareness. Of course, they the notion of the public being clearly aware of what's going on means that you're going to force f force regulation. And once you're aware of something, consumers typically react, and when they react, they get government to react, and their that whole uh, si su process led to the Federal Trade Commission, Federal Communication Commission, all these agencies that are designed to regulate what business can and cannot do, um, and c establish consumer rights. Uh, the unofficial anthem of the internet economy uh, is some lyrics from a song, every breath you take, every move you make, every bond you break, every step you take, I'll be watching you. Uh, it also happens to be the secret wish of some government agencies. I, I'll get to those in, in a minute. Um, she who controls the internet controls the world. Maybe. I mean, you know. But that's some of the thinking out there because, let's face it, when people here can influence what happens in Iran after an election in Iran happens that the Iranian people don't like, when people here can influence democracy movements in North Africa and the Middle East, when people here can influence state policy, let's face it, you're bypassing this, the policy of the federal government and influencing what's going on in countries around the world because you're blogging, you're writing, you're communicating, you're doing this as individuals, uh, and you're, you're much more, there are more resources right now on the internet than the government could ever ma ma muster. So there are a couple of things that I think you should be mindful of. Like with radio, that time they mentioned war, World War I, that was a reason for taking over all the radio stations. So when someone starts talking about cyber war and cyber terrorism as it relates to the internet, you should be in that room <laughs> because th th those conversations have been going on since about 2009. And getting the people who actually use the internet every day, the organizations, the individuals who actually use this, the consumers in the process of the discussions that are going on to make sure those interests are part of the dialogue has been a very difficult thing. Now, we have a couple of programs that I want you to be aware of. The National Strategy for Trusted Identities. This program basically says every web page will be certified as being okay. And every user will have a, an identity, doc basically a driver's license for the internet. So if you try to visit a page, you have to have this credential that says you're okay in order to have access to that page. 
Now, the reason for doing this is the cyber threat, the cyber warfare, and then, of course, uh, phishing, farming, you know, hackers, whatever, you know, you list, you list it, and that's the reason for wanting to do this. Now, if you think of the, the Internet as a huge global community of people, the bad things that happen based on the number of people who are online is very small. Not that it's okay, because there are some issues out there. But the level of interest and focus that's been put into this by federal government agencies, by major corporations who combine their interests into trying to develop this national strategy for trusted identities should raise a few eyebrows. Now, th what's interesting is that the Chamber of Commerce has a web box on their site where the, in, on April 15th they're going to announce what the national strategy for trusted identities is going to be, and they're going to be pushing this. And what we're starting to hear is that it's a private sector project. In fact, it was a federal government project. When you use the bully pulpit of the federal government, you can get private sector entities to do a lot of stuff. They, they, their interests are aligned. Being able to know everything about people who are online, very intimate details about how people think, what makes them do the things that they do, how they react, who are the influencers, how are they using the internet, to actually affect a lot of a lot of the things that we do in policy and society is raising some eyebrows. And there's some interest in this. The Department of Homeland Security put in a Federal Register notice on February 1st this program. It, and they did it as a, a, this is a data collection program. It's under the Privacy Act, which requires a notice in the Federal Register when an agency is going to collect <laughs> personal identifiable information on individuals. This notice went up in February 1st. It basically is about publicly available social media monitoring and situational awareness initiative system of records. This is the exact words out of this, this Federal Register notice. This is not good, okay? This is a nanny cam, and, the, and DHS is going to be running it. So, you know, we're always in a tussle with DHS. Nice folks just got some very interesting interest in the details of our lives that we would rather see them not have. Anyway wanted to make sure you knew that. This is as what is good for business is now good for government. This is a, a clip on the web page that the, the uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce has, and I'll keep that in the slide. But the, the thing that I want to make sure I leave with you is that you are a mighty force out there. You are constituents of people. You are thought leaders. You are opinion leaders. And while you got the mic or the gavel, the people who had radio, if they un only understood what was about to happen, if they could have used their bully pulpit to influence policy and save their independence, this is your opportunity to fight for your independence. And part of doing that is making your voice heard in public policy for uh, forms that are created. The Federal Trade Commission just put out a request for public comment on Google Buzz, and it's asking the public to comment. Epic created a website so that you can go and very easily offer your comments and be heard. We're encouraging people to do this to make sure that it is, I'm sorry, don't have internet access, to make sure that your voices are heard. M spread this message, make it viral, because the more comments that come in, that will influence, they're asking for two pieces of information, your, your, your name, which could be your last name if you want, and your state. That information is going to have a certain level of resonance with policymakers. The volume and the numbers of people who comment will resonate with policymakers. You need to be in those rooms. When they are talking about putting out policy, like the National Strategy for uh, Trusted Identities in Cyberspace, you need to be in the room. And that policy shouldn't roll forward until you've had a chance to have your say. The policy that's going to be announced is going to be final. And mo how many of you have ever heard of it? One person, OK? These are the policies that will reshape your world. And they'll influence wh what you can do and wh how you can do it. I and the, the one with DHS is about collecting data on you. Which ones of you are really the troublemakers? I don't know. <laughs> you know. And being able, and the instinct will be able to block you having access to the internet. It potentially could. I'm not going to say that's going to be the outcome, but it could. And it can block you having access to content. So being vocal, being aggressive about your rights, being aggressive about your privacy, 
because of the type of information that's being collected and how meaning is put to that information. Because it's not just about the data, it's about what they say the data means about the individuals that are that's important. I'll leave it at that and take questions later. Thank you. Um, so there's basically uh, two kind of principles that you should keep in mind when we're discussing uh, internet privacy technologies. Uh, one is that on a computer, reading is a two-way communication. Whoever is giving you data needs to know where to send it. So it's not like you're just sitting you're in your home reading a book. The person who's delivering the book needs to know to send it directly to you. So that when you're asking a website for, uh, hey, tell me, uh, send me this video, the website needs to, of course, know exactly your house or your computer to send it to. Uh, and then the second principle is that what appears to be an interaction with one entity can actually be an interaction with several. So when I go to a website, uh, type into my browser, go to CNN.com, you're not just getting information from CNN. You're pulling in information from all sorts of third parties uh, that you may not be aware of. Like your computer is doing it on its own, but what appears on your browser, uh, maybe even just the layout and the display makes it look like it's all one first party interaction, but it's not quite that way. So here's an example of, let's say, the, the Huffington Post website. Um, I went and just, uh, this is back when we were worried about the government shutdown earlier this week, uh, the, uh, and, and just circled some of the third party services that are on this website. You think you just went to the Huffington Post URL up at the top in the green, uh, but, what's actually, but what you're actually seeing is uh, ads from third-party servers, uh, the Twitter and Facebook share stuff down right at the bottom. That, uh, and then on the bottom left there, you also see the share the story with Facebook. Uh, the effect that this has when you combine those two principles, Facebook now knows that you are wa looking at this Huffington Post website uh, just because you've loaded up that share with Facebook button. Your ability to sh share with Facebook means that you've sent Facebook a message that I'm at the URL that's in green, uh, and if I, if, if I have an account with Facebook, they've now associated that with your account. If you don't have an account with Facebook, uh, then they've associate, they can associate it at least with some of your information about your computer, such as your IP address, uh, that they can store for later for when you do have an account with Facebook. Uh, here's another example. This is a blog I enjoy reading about uh, left-wing politics. Uh, it's on blogs, it's on blogger.com, which I think is now a Google property. So here are several, um, several third party advertisements on there um, from, uh, uh, from several services. You can see uh, this blog has figured out that uh, I enjoy left wing politics. Um, and I don't know how I got that Groupon ad, uh, but it's again, it comes from a third party server. Um, so the basic kinds of technologies that we're talking about here are, like I mentioned, the IP address of your device, how to direct information to your computer. Uh, these get logged by uh, the computer servers. They, this is when the, computer, when the web servers were originally built. You, if you install one on your computer, it'll probably turn on logging by default. That's how it works. Um, the issue of cookies. The uh, main question of cookies is the first party versus third party cookies. When you go to CNN, CNN puts a cookie on your computer. They can, uh, they can you, when you visit CNN again, they can tell to show you the mainland US site versus some international site. The third party cookie follows you as you go from CNN, as you go to Fox News, as you go to a different websites, they can track you across the websites. Uh, the second technology, another technology is the web bugs. Uh, this is similar to the Facebook like button. When there's a Facebook like button on a site, you're, that's being loaded from Facebook. Facebook knows that uh, you visited that site. And there's several more uh, that, that are much more than we can go into now. Um, so like I mentioned, the IP address, a couple things to know. It's disclosed to each website when you visit. It has to be. That's how the website knows to send the data to your computer. Uh, so we, we, we really can't get around this. You can, you can hide behind what are proxy servers so that I, it's kind of like if I, if I wanted to send a letter to Angela, but I didn't want Angela to know it came from me, I would send it to Lily first, and then Lily would send it to Angela. You can bounce it around like that. 
Uh, but, and so there are technologies to do that, but most people aren't browsing the internet like that. They are almost unique to your computer, not necessarily persistent. Um, and and a, very, and a very key question in a lot of um, privacy legislation is whether this IP address constitutes personal information. Uh, the cookies I explained earlier, uh, the first party versus third party, uh, the main thing to remember about them is that they're like a name and a value pair. So for example, the cookie can say language, English. It knows that next time you visit this website, it'll show you the English language version of the website. Uh, or it can record your user ID as you visit this website. Uh, remember I mentioned those, uh, you know, I went to the Huffington Post and saw how there were like several third parties showing me ads. Each one of those third parties has the opportunity to place a cookie on your computer with whatever value pairs it, it, it has. Each one of those can assign me a different unique user ID that they can then find me when I'm on another website that their same third party ad server runs. The web bugs, you like this. Elements such as small images and web pages or emails, these, you can find these, these are used in email marketing as well to track whether you've opened an email uh, or whether you read it. You know, some of your uh, mail, mail um, clients will say, will ask you, do you want to display the images? When you're displaying the images in the mail, uh, you're loading the images from the third part, from the foreign server, and that's how they know that you've read the mail. Uh, so since there's a hit, they allow you to notice that you visited the bug site without you clicking. You don't need to interact. You don't need to say share this on Facebook. You don't need to say uh, buzz this or dig or tweet. Just the fact that they've loaded it onto the website is enough for them to track uh, that you've been on, the, on that website. Um, and then uh, kind of a next level is just general scripts. They can perform a lot of the work that cookies do uh, your browser might be able to block third-party cookies, or, but it might not block scripts. You might not uh, be able to block scripts because it might make the website unusable. Uh, they can be used to serve ads or any other content. Uh, they can be past data that identifies you. Uh, for example, um, uh, the fa the, a lot of websites have the Facebook Connect feature now where you can interact with your Facebook uh, your Facebook uh, login on the website and share your art the article that you're reading with your friends via that, and you can see what your friends are commenting on that article. Uh, that's a script kind of service. Uh, Facebook, uh, on its website, runs its own scripts, which uh, can serve, uh, serve ads via the applications, and those applications are being passed Facebook user IDs uh, so that then the ads, ad networks are collecting your uh, Facebook identity uh, which Facebook said uh, was against their policy, but they were still getting, getting the data. And there are more. Uh, the, uh, we, the, besides the idea of the regular cookies that I, that I mentioned that have been around for uh, since the 90s, there are now new uh, technologies known as a flash cookie. This works on the, um, uh, the, the YouTube videos run using flash technology. That technology itself has an ability to record persistent state like a cookie, and then, uh, so then they can store information in that part of your computer and use it to respawn the regular cookies after you delete them. There's a couple uh, class action lawsuits over some uh, ad companies that were doing this. They would uh, they'd say, oh, the, uh, users love their privacy. If you like your privacy, you should delete your cookies, blah, blah, blah. Well, they were finding this really annoying. So they, they, they would let you delete your cookies and then uh, recreate them as soon uh, with the exact information that was on them before after you've deleted them. Um, and then, and this is all, all these technologies were basically web browser-based technologies. Um, Jeff mentioned a lot about mobile. The, the key thing to remember about mobile technologies is that there are many fewer cookie con uh, controls that you have. Maybe you can get your browser if, uh, you know, I've got mine, I've downloaded these extensions on it which make me feel safe. Uh, like to control scripts and to control cookies, my your your mobile phone likely doesn't have anything like that. Uh, you can access the mobile devices; they you potentially have access to other parts of your phone, like your inbox, your or your um, or your list of your all your contacts. But the main thing about mobile devices is that unlike uh, the IP address for a computer, which is ephemeral when you move to a different uh, when you plug into a different internet account, you'll get a different IP address. Mobile devices do have 
unique hardware device IDs. Um, and they're, I think the, the actual term is the UDID, Universal Device Identifier. These have been known to be shared by the ad networks and collected by the ad networks. Uh, and these are, are in the device. There, there's been some people who have come up with some programs to mask them, but they, they're not really done. Uh, and so then these, these uh, now the advertising networks can track your, uh, your, your unique device uh, pretty much without you stopping it. Uh, and they are getting past this data. For example, people have found, uh, uh, an investigation by the Wall Street Journal found that uh, uh, applications such as Pandora and others were passing via the application to the advertisers the location, gender, and unique device ID of the telephones um, that were using the Pandora application. While we set this up, uh, does anyone have a, a question in back there, Lars? Or, no, sorry, not Lars. You, I'm sorry. long as time allows. So my first question is that uh, what are the other negative consequences to digital marketing um, in addition to uh, you know, um, consumers being bombarded by more advertisements? What, what else could happen? Should we care about you know, more digital marketing? And um, you know, wh what bad things, what else could happen? And the other question is that um, I read an interesting article um, from New York, New York Times, and it's about um, uh, the web means the end of forgetting. And it talks about um, something was being done to protect privacy on the level of technology level. For example, um, the, uh, there's this new technology uh, which kind of uh, design uh, data that has an expiration date. So, you know, after a while, uh, these personal da data will just expire automatically. So do you know if there's anything uh, has been done on the level of um, technology to protect uh, privacy? Thanks. All right. The, um, I, I think the best examples uh, about the harm of digital marketing are its role in um, financial and um, pharmaceutical uh, marketing. In the case of the pharmaceutical industry, uh, which we have the FTC currently investigating, I mean, the, the business model for the pharmaceutical and the health sites are to basically identify you and to move you what, th what they call through the online patient journey so that you will ask your doctor. So they, they will deploy all kinds of technologies and techniques so that you will ask your doctor, or they also know, and maybe a physician's assistant who also prescribes, they're targeting them too. It's working both ways. Targeting is occurring at the consumer level, and it's called e-detailing. It's, it's, it's being, uh, used, technologies are being used at the health professional level to get them to drugs. The, so the goal is to get you to ask your doctor for prescription X, for depression, for 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 uh, 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 arthritis, for a whole host of things. So they are using this much more powerful than television. We know television advertising. You ready, Angela? Television advertising has dramatically increased the 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 the, the, the sales of prescription drugs. And the financial sector, you saw it in the subprime crisis where they used online to get people to take out subprime loans. You're seeing a lot of techniques now to get people to get higher rate credit cards. That will be the subject of a complaint coming soon. Right. The, the privacy component, there's a, something called privacy by design. It's now kind of caught fire with computing technologists and researchers. Uh, the drive is to actually build privacy in from the research and development phase. Uh, I think that that's a good thing, but you can't just take the word of an entity that this is privacy enhancing or pri privacy protective. Uh, it takes a lot to be able to do that in an internet space where the whole business model is about data collection, which is in violation of your privacy. Okay, thanks. Uh, again, I, Angela Campbell, we're going to take more questions later. Um, can we wait? Uh, all right, go ahead. Um, I could be wrong, but I heard your question as being not simply what are the other aspects of marketing we might want to be concerned about, but what, in addition to marketing, might we be concerned about? And 
there's a video, a, a four minute video that's on YouTube that um, talks about Facebook and how the people involved in it, and I, I, I'd like to think there's nothing to it, but it says that the, the people at the heart of Facebook have these backgrounds in the U.S. intelligence community, that they're, they're, they're spooks of one kind or another C with CIA connections. Now, I don't know if this is completely off the wall and, uh, you know, it's just well, conspiracy theory, but uh, I, I wonder if you've come across that idea. But even if that's not true, are there other concerns we might have legitimately about other entities collecting data for other purposes, like keeping track of us you know, as individuals within the society? Thank you. Um, just real quick about that. There's, there's nothing new about US or uh, intelligence services uh, purchasing data on the market. Like, like you, can buy, you can purchase data on people's reputations. You can purchase data about people. Uh, so uh, w we don't need to take the step of, of there's, uh, there's some insidious purpose within a, a particular corporation. Uh, some corporations are in the business of selling data to the government uh, and compiling data from public records or from other sources. Uh, so, but but so that gets to the kind of the, the harms are there's a harm to your to reputation. People are building databases of your reputation that you don't control, uh, and then the other potential harm is profiling uh, of uh, red, like such as red digital redlining. Uh, you don't know that the content that you're seeing might be different from the content that somebody else is seeing online. It's been tailored to you, but tailored to uh, somebody else's vision of you, not your vision of you. Yeah, I, okay, thanks. Yeah, I, I mean, there's a great question. We'll have lots of, um, hopefully, some time the, to raise some of these issues. So let me, since you mentioned Facebook, how many of you have ever used Facebook? Could you raise your hand? Wow, okay. Now, uh, if you read the Facebook privacy policy, would you raise your hand? That's pretty impressive. Um, I think that uh, most people don't read them. And... Um, I don't, we don't have internet connection. I was going to take you to the Facebook privacy policy. It's got, I think, nine sections, and they're all multi, multi-page sections. They're, it's very long. It's very hard to read. Uh, it's hard to understand b because it's l written by lawyers. Um, and, you know, even if you're a lawyer, it's hard to understand because unless you understand how this whole network of like, cookies and uh, online auctions and data uh, miners and brokers and so on, unless you understand how this system works, you don't really know what you're consenting to. So I think it, there's pretty wide uh, agreement. And, and then think about this, is that how many websites do you visit in one day? And they all have privacy policies. You could spend your whole day reading privacy policies and never doing anything else. So. Um, so it's really not possible for individuals to protect their privacy online today. And even as Glary was explaining, even the, the most technically sophisticated among us uh, can't um, overcome all of the obstacles. So, um, so this means there has to be some regulation here. And uh, I think we really are at a, we're at the beginning, but we're at a critical time because there's lots of talk going on about privacy. Uh, the industry is a little bit on the run, I think, because of the, the work that Jeff and this small and Lily and others in the privacy community have been, been doing. And so we do, ha and also in Congress, um, privacy is one of the few issues that is actually seen as bipartisan. So uh, there is some possibility of legislation. Um, but nothing will happen unless the public really demands it, and that's one of the reasons why we're here talking to you today. Um, and I think there's there's plenty of room for more public participation in these debates. Um, so um, I'm going to sort of, I think you've gotten a great education so far. I'm going to try to educate you a little bit more about how privacy is currently regulated or is not regulated and what some of those opportunities for advocacy are. So in Europe and Canada, um, they have um, comprehensive privacy laws um, that, that govern all kinds of businesses. Um, in the U.S., we have taken a very different approach. And it is very, um, instead of having you know, general privacy uh, protections, we only have uh, laws in place where there's been a problem. 
Um, some of you may remember uh, when uh, Bork's, at Bork's confirmation hearings, it came up that uh, someone had obtained his videotape rental records. And so as a result, Congress passed the Video Privacy Protection Act, which protects you from having your uh, videotape records released. Of course, today, if you think about Amazon, Netflix, Hulu, and all these, th they can collect all kinds and much more detailed information than just what you watched, and yet there's really no restrictions on what they can do. Another example of a, sp a specific privacy law Jeff mentioned earlier uh, is the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. And again, there was a specific complaint that Jeff and I filed uh, about websites collecting information from children, very sensitive information from children without their parents even knowing about it. And so Congress again stepped in and passed a law that limits the collection of data um, from children uh, 12 and under without parental consent. Um, in the late 1990s, the Federal Trade Commission uh, did actually recommend legislation to protect adults, but this bill was never passed. And under the Obama administration, we are seeing a, a sort of a renewed interest in protecting consumer privacy. And so the FTC has been active. They've had a number of workshops. You can go online. You can watch them uh, at the FTC's website. Um, they've, they've initiated a proceeding to update the Children's Online Privacy Protection Rules, which is very much needs to be updated. Um, and they've taken a number of enforcement actions, such as this Google Buzz settlement, which I hope Lily will tell us a little bit more about uh, in the question period. Um, another thing that the um, F FTC, oh, okay, I don't know why that didn't work. Uh, they, they've done is they've put out a, a proposed privacy framework. And um, some of the things that the FTC is, is proposing is that there you wouldn't the what the sites would not have to give notice and comment for commonly accepted practices. So if you're just giving your address so that they can send you the product that you purchased, they wouldn't have to get your um, well, they wouldn't have to give you notice even, I guess. Um, but where notice uh, was in consent is required, uh, they want clearer notices, shorter notices, standardized notices. Um, they should be offered when you're making the decision about whether to give up the information. Um, there's some kinds of purposes and some kinds of users where they would require what they call um, opt-in as opposed to opt-out. In other words, you would have to affirmatively consent. In plain English? Uh, it's supposed to be in plain English, but, you know, it, again, I think it's going to be very hard to, to have uh, the sort of level of detail that you need to know and still be easily understood by people. And you know, when you think about the literacy in our country and the reading level, that's a problem. Um, there's going to be uh, some of the sensitive users they're talking about children. I think some of the sensitive uses would be, in, for example, in health and financial areas. And then they've also uh, floated this proposal for a do not track. And the idea here is like they have the do not call registry. So if you you sign up for this, then you're not supposed to get calls from, um, you know, marketers. And this this would be sort of the same thing, but it's really unclear how it would work and whether it will work, and it won't work if everyone doesn't participate. And at this point, this is all uh, anticipated just simply to be a voluntary uh, framework. Okay, um, so um, but the FCC. FTC got, I think, more than 400 comments, and, and they're still taking comments. There'll probably be more opportunities for comments. If you've got concerns, by all means, let the FTC know that. Um, the Department of Commerce and the White House are also involved, um, and but they come at it from a little bit different perspective. Um, the the F FTC's uh, goal is consumer protection. Their role is really to promote commerce. And so they're concerned about the free flow of commerce information, and they're concerned when states pass laws that, that might protect your privacy because that makes it harder for corporations to do business because it costs more. And they also want to be able to have global trade, and since other countries have more protective laws than we do, they have to 
have something in place so they can say, say we meet the standards for I international trade. So they also have put out a uh, proposed framework. And uh, again, they're, well, they, they're actually a somewhat different approach. Um, they're, they want to revitalize what are called fair information practices. Uh, again, tr increasing, increasing transparency and limiting use are some of those practices. Um, these are actually very important principles. Um, the, the question is how, wh how much they're imp implemented. And then they also want to encourage the industries to develop their own voluntary codes of conduct with stakeholder participation. Uh, then they would be approved by the government and then they would be enforceable by the Federal Trade Commission. Now, Congress has also gotten into the act. Um, there are two bills in the House right now, the Best Practices Act, which is um, Rush, and then uh, the Do Not Track Me Online, which is um, Spear. Jackie Spear. Jackie Spear. Uh, Cliff Stearns is also, um, has a draft circulating, and uh, Carrie, Senate, on the Senate side, uh, Carrie and McCain have a, a draft that's circulating. Um, so the industry, uh, I wish I could show you this, but um, th the all of the major trade associations, the, the Council of Better Business Bureaus, the Interactive Advertising Bureau, the, uh, the four A's, all, all the different advertising uh, direct marketers have gotten together. And if this is their website that explains about their self-regulatory program, which they're really trying to put forth as an alternative to government regulation. Um, and it, I think there's a lot of reasons to be very skeptical about this. Um, I mean, if there's nothing to back it up. Um, and so um, I guess the final slide I have is um, what can you do? And I think we're, we've already chatted about this a little bit, but it's important that you educate yourself. It's, it's not easy, but you know, if you, you need to understand what's going on when you go to a website, when information's being collected. Uh, and it, you know, I do encourage you to read privacy statements, um, but that's not gonna be enough. And so we really hope you will um, think about these issues and advocate for these issues um, as, it, as mentioned, there's, there's a lot going on right now uh, at the federal, registry, federal regulatory agencies, at the Congress, and of course at the state level as well. So um, I think I will stop here because I'd really like to uh, hear your questions and get, hopefully get you some answers. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll start with you. Uh, thank you, my name is Shelley Alpern. Um, and thank you for all the great work that you're all doing. I'm wondering if there's been any evidence um, in recent months that the um, uh, governments in the Middle East where there's been a lot of uh, civil um, uh, revolutions lately <laughs> uh, have been using any of this tracking information to persecute um, the people doing the protesting. Uh, actually, yes. It happened in Iran. Uh, they were tr they were really pressing to try to figure out where people were because people were wor moving around and people were giving outside of the country were giving advice on how to hide their communication and how to obscure IP addresses. You ha wherever you are, there is an on ramp onto the internet, and that on ramp is going to give an ind indication of where you might be physically. So a lot of that was going on, but more importantly, they were also going after ISPs like in. Egypt, they had maybe five, and they basically called them up and said, "Shut the internet down," which inflamed the whole process, uh, the whole situation uh, greatly. But each country is reacting to this differently. But the more oppressive the regime, the more interest they have in controlling and identifying who's online and where they are. And, what they're saying. and I think the important thing to remember about that is that these countries aren't doing this on their own. The technologies that they have uh, to access this are coming from uh, from coming from the West. The social, the social media surveillance technologies, you can, if you go to my website, democraticmedia.org, you'll, we, we name them. But the social media surveillance technologies are, 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 are off the shelf, and anybody can buy them, and you can, you can be sure governments are buying them. And Facebook, I hate to pick out, I mean, you know, Microsoft is selling all these technologies. They're based in Beijing, they're making it available to, to the Chinese government, but Facebook is currying favor in China and Vietnam and making sure, you can be sure the message there as they get permission to expand the market is, we will give you access. 
And that goes back to why we're paying attention to DHS wanting situational awareness on social networking sites in the U.S. Um, other, well, he, he, all right, we'll go back and forth. You'll be next. <laughs> all right, uh, in the second row. Hi, there's so much questions. Um, so I guess uh, first thing I want to ask uh, about the privacy icons developed at Mozilla. I think they're an amazing step forward. I don't know if you've seen them or not, but uh, someone went through a great effort to make these really uh, nice icons. And if we can adopt those on privacy policies, that would be a great step. But what I wanted to ask you is sort of the argument on the other side about there's no free lunch kind of thing, you know? Um, and I like to bust that argument. First of all, you can't even pay for your privacy. I have a feeling if you give Google your, if you have a premium service like from Google, they'll still track you anyways. Um, so, uh, and how, how can we, I mean, the, short of redesigning the architecture of the internet and trying to come up with a consumer vendor type relationship uh, protocol or something like that, I mean, is, are we too late, you know, to end the game as far as the business model around information delivery and how can we overcome? And uh, one other thing is too is the, uh, interestingly enough, um, the commerce situation, because other countries are so used to privacy laws, they're actually, it's actually backfiring because they don't want to do business you know, in the U.S. Um, so there's actually a case to be made that stronger pr privacy protection um, will increase global business. Um, so I just, I guess I want to address sort of the business model aspects and uh, bust in the argument about there's no free lunch if you, you know, it, you can't expect the internet to be free without giving up your privacy. I wanted to offer that one, it's not too late because these are major corporations and they don't want to be in violation of the law. The last thing they want on the headline is that they've broken a law. Two, privacy has always been a struggle between what someone else wants to do and what you need, what you need to have happen with your personal information. And over history, individuals have been able to win that battle. What they've worked very hard at is hiding the fact that they're exploiting personal information about you as a consumer. So when we see good products out there, Epic actually has a, a privacy tools page, but there are always companies out there trying to push the envelope. And I think the pendulum regarding what people care about online versus I don't care versus now I care a lot because it's affecting me, my ability to get a job, get a loan, uh, get access to information, get get a fair price for something I'm shopping for. Those are the, the, the things that are on the table right now. So I think the pendulum is swinging. I, I will say that I don't think at this point we can undo the basic business model that's been created, that's migrated all around the world, where this very intensive personalized data collection and host of other techniques to get you involved with the site and the content and the advertising, we can't do anything really to under uh, overturn that. That is so dominant now. If you look at the companies doing it, just look at the global uh, uh, consortiums of the lobbying organizations, IAB, Interactive Advertising Bureau, in every European country, all throughout Asia. We can limit it. Now, no one is saying they can't advertise. What we are saying is that individuals, citizens and consumers, right, should have a choice. They should make the decision. They should be able to opt in. We, we, we have arguments back and forth about exactly what the term should be. I talk about financial information, health information, racial information, uh, you know, location information, where, where, where they c should not be able to collect without letting you know exactly what's going on and you decide first, because right now the default is collection. So they can make a lot of money and still have fair privacy rules. And even though the European Union is the is in the forefront here, and we can talk about their role, the fact of the matter is, even though they have good privacy laws, all the things we talked about are happening in the European Union without really any kind of safeguards. So, uh, and, and the companies are expanding. Um, and I want to touch on that, that the no free lunch point that you made, because this is very important. That's It's basically the, the counter argument. Uh, that is made against all, all these privacy controls is that we need to collect all this information and we need to create this architecture so that uh, y you people can have this wonderful media landscape that you're also enjoying, right? And and I think uh, this is this is something that I think would be particularly offensive to to media activists that the idea that we have to commercialize the medium in which you're in which you're you're operating. So a couple of things to remember about that is uh, number one, even though we have shown you a lot of the behavioral technologies, advertising doesn't have to be behavioral online. It uh, a lot of it actually isn't. Google's major product is 
uh, contextual ads, where they'll show you an ad that is based upon the information on the web page that you're reading. It's not based on the information that Google has about you. Very different privacy issues there. Uh, and then another one to remember is who's actually getting this money. Uh, you're, it's not like you're going to, uh, to when you go to some page on blogger.com that's full of ads, you know, that blogger's not making all that money. That money's going to the advertising networks. Uh, that money's going to the, the consolidated companies uh, that are leveraging the individual participation and individuals kind of, you know, everybody making their own cool little blogger blog, all these uh, voices out there. Uh, those are really all uh, uh, what's the back end behind that is a large consolidated media entity. Uh, so when we talk about consolidation in the, in the privacy world, we're talking about consolidating databases and consolidating market power, but not, not necessarily consolidating the production of content, but at least consolidating who's getting the money for the content that's being produced. Uh, okay, I, I pro promised uh, that he, he would get the next question. <laughs> uh, thank you. Hopefully this will be short. Uh, thank you all, first of all. And I have uh, two questions that are probably related. The first is that it, you mentioned that if there's a problem, something ends up being done in the United States. Uh, is a possible sort of subversive strategy to create problems? Uh, <laughs> I, I remember, uh, again, in this Wall Street series about privacy, they have the example of they give the string of numbers and letters for a cookie and shows what it encodes, but maybe actually you know, doing that with specific people who are decision makers. Or again, it's, if it's all perfectly legal for advertisers to do, just purchase that information and uh, share it with the people about it's about. If you have somebody's email address, e send them an email with that, buy that information, say, here's what's been collected about you. Or is, is that itself unethical? Just a suggestion. The, 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 <laughs> the other question, um, is uh, I had seen a presentation, this might be a bit dated and now, it was two years ago, that there's still a, a tremendous amount of anxiety in the advertising world that behavioral advertising, where all these new internet advertising techniques are even effective. You know, the old maxim that half the money is wasted, I just don't know which half, still holds. Uh, and I'm wondering, y you had mentioned um, subprimes and pharmaceutical as a case where we see clear evidence that it's working. Maybe those are exceptions, but do we, have any evidence that maybe advertising is overvalued. Maybe there's an argument to be made there. I have to disagree with Guillermo. It's gone far beyond contextual. That's why Google bought DoubleClick, the largest display advertiser, and that's why we fought it. Um, the business model is the integration of all of these data sets about you as an individual and you as a friend um, that's able to be updated in real time. In the last two years, you have now instantaneous online and offline integration of databases. So you know your credit bureau account, all that can be integrated into your online behavior. So behavior is the way to go. Uh, uh, th their research indicates behavior is the way to go. But even if the research indicated it wasn't the way to go, they all have embraced this business model. And one thing I could have said at that first slide is, uh, just as you saw a tremendous investment in the 1990s, with, and, and which led to media consolidation, tremendous investment, M&A money, merger money, going into the digital marketing technologies to identify individual behavior for targeting. That, so that's the model moving forward, and that's the model we have to fight. It's your identity that's for sale in 20 milliseconds to the highest bidder. Uh, I'd like to add that people have tried what you've suggested. It just causes too much distraction. What you're trying to get people to do is focus on how data is being used. You can't make Epsilon happen. It had, had, this is a, the story that broke last week about this company who had all the email addresses and the correct financial institutions to go along with them. So those phishing things when you get the wrong bank writing you an email, you know to ignore. Well, now they're going to have a, an idea of which goes with what. So the thing that I think we should be doing, um, Jeff's website, um, Center for Digital Democracy, Epic's website, we keep up with every breaking story, every news item about privacy. Blog about it, write about it, push that data out so people learn about it. The uh, FTC comment period for the bus agreement is huge. 
uh, they're asking the public to tell them what, what you think about it. And and they're going to either go forward with this agreement, they'll modify it, they can make it more, more di you know, put a little more teeth in it, or they can make it weaker based on the public comment. These are moments to educate people about what's going on. Um, as far as your second question, I think, you, you know, there's probably some reason to be skeptical, skeptical about some of the claims made by marketers. In other, you know, like there's a lot of neuroscience and neuromarketing going on, and that may or may not pan out. Um, but, but the basic model is very attractive to advertisers because instead of having to pay a l lot of money to reach a large number of people, most of whom have no interest in your... Um, the product that you're selling, you know, let's say you're selling trucks and you're, you know, advertising on television, you're paying a lot and probably not very many people are that interested in buying a truck at the time. Whereas if you know that someone's been looking at trucks online and you can then target them, it's going to be much more effective. And it's also a lot cheaper. Um, the uh, So I think it is a very effective for the advertisers on the whole. Um, there's a lot of work being done in terms of how to measure it and how to charge for it and sometimes they only have to pay if they actually get someone clicking through and so on. Um, but it does also raise sort of an interesting question about uh, one thing that really concerns me is how the advertising influences the content. Um, because on we have this problem in radio um, of uh, no urban dictates. So if uh, advertisers say well, they don't want to advertise on urban stations, those stations can make less money and, and so there, it's harder for them to survive. So I, I worry about that, that this is really no urban dictates on steroids because when they advertise, they're not just saying don't advertise to blacks or do advertise to blacks. There is much more granular than that. And, and the, certain websites are gonna get a lot of advertising and some of them that might be reaching people that don't say consume a lot. Um, may not be getting much advertising revenue at all. And so I, I think that's something to really watch. And also the fact that everyone's seeing something different can, uh, can allow for discrimination. And I think on the point about uh, should we create problems, there's plenty of problems out there already. And so there's, you know, one, the first step could be to just point them out, uh, which is what we've been doing with our complaints. Um, and then the other thing is that sometimes when, when, when you do create the problem, uh, like by targeting a, a congressman, for example, th this was done with uh, with people uh, pretexting phone records. It used to be you could buy uh, telephone records from uh, private investigators. The private investigator would call up your your cell phone company, pretending to be you, uh, get your your last bill, and then sell that uh, back to you for about a hundred bucks. You could find these online. Uh, somebody did that to a congressman, uh, and now there's uh, doing that is uh, a, penal a, f a felony punishable by like 10 years in jail. Uh, but there's no, but Congress didn't put new regulations on the phone company to protect the data. Congress punished, you know, the, the you know, identified that the problem was, hey, some jerk out there could do this to me, that jerk should go to jail. N uh, but when really what is the, the protection needed to be was the phone companies uh, raising their level of security. Uh, so th the FCC did do that, but uh, on, on its own and without somebody pissing off, I think it was like John McCain or somebody who this happened to. Okay, we'll take a question over there against the wall. Thank you. Uh, it seems to me that it's almost impossible for uh, law and public policy to keep up with uh, uh, changes in technology, particularly information and communications technologies, which are driven by Moore's law, among other things. So it seems to me that uh, we'd have greater privacy protection, not tying it to specific mm -hmm. technologies, but having general privacy protection. Currently, 10 states have explicit um, rights of privacy in their state constitutions. They, they include California, Illinois, Florida, and other states, which means 40 do not. So would it not enhance the privacy protection of citizens and consumers if the other 40 states were to adopt an explicit privacy uh, right in the Constitution, as well as amending the U.S. Constitution to include a, an explicit right of privacy rather than relying on, say, Fourth Amendment and other sort of uh, implied rights of privacy in, in some of the other amendments. For example, the Fourth Amendment gives you a reasonable expectation of privacy. And how can you know what a reasonable expectation when you don't know the capacity of ever-changing uh, technologies? And lastly, would it not improve our privacy protection if, we, if Congress were to establish a privacy commission? Yes. Now, I, 
I love everything you said. And especially because they use a reasonable person standard to measure whether something is okay or not okay under the, the Constitution protections that we, the penumbra of, of, of things within the Constitution that establish privacy rights. But this goes into one other thing I wanted to tell you about. There is a meeting that happens annually called Computers, Freedom, and Privacy, and part of the discussion is getting to some of those issues about policy, whether policymakers are tech savvy enough to figure these things out. Can we do more with research and uh, activists to try to shore up privacy rights and freedom? Uh, and a lot of those issues get, get started and some projects get started out of that meeting. This year it's in Washington, D.C., June 14th through 16th. If you're interested, you can go to epic.org. But those are the types of things that we should be thinking about in order to address privacy problems. I have to say that we are very honored and privileged to have one of the country's leading media scholars and ac adv advocates and activists, Nolan Bowie here, uh, 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 asking critical questions and, uh, you know, and hope you read his uh, prodigious work. Um, I will tell, I'll meet, let me answer you. First place, just in terms of Congress and the states, look, it's going the wrong way. I guess go back to the first question. But we spotted this as a, as a wing of the progressive media movement. I spotted this in the mid-1990s. That's when we got the law passed on children. We try to get everybody. This has been going on for 15 years. The progressive community has not focused on. We could have passed privacy laws that, to affect all this if we had acted back in the 1990s because the bi basic business model that we see today that's become incredibly sophisticated and perversive was created, this one-to-one -one model. Back in the 90s, it was clear where this was going. We, we waited so long. Now we are on the cusp of something, in part because of the Europeans. We may be able to do something, but we made a strategic error, too. We are, for, we are marginalized. This is a relatively new era, uh, er, area where there's not much progressive participation. There's only a handful, of, a tiny, tiny, tiny handful of, of privacy groups. I mean, Epic is the real group here, an Electronic Frontier Foundation. Other groups are getting money from Google and, and all the others, so you have that, that terrible erosion. Right now, and the Obama administration is actually trying to weaken privacy, which is, and we're one of the few groups along with Epic that's critical of the Obama administration because what the big companies want, Google, Google and Facebook went to Obama and said, we don't want the Europeans to strengthen their privacy laws because they're based on rights. And we're afraid the Asian Pacific countries, which is really the big market, it's all about Asia Pacific here. This, that's the goal. We don't want the Asia Pacific countries, which are now negotiating with the U.S. a new data protection law, to adopt the European model. So please, Obama administration, take away the power from the FTC, which is in the proposal, and basic, pass a law based on self-regulation that would also preempt all the states. So right now, that's what you'll see Senator Kerry's bill on Monday do, which we are opposing. Right? It will pre. It will basically preempt the states. Um, and uh, it sets up the Department of Commerce as the key policy arm. It's focused on self-regulation, and we're going to do our best to fight it, but it's going the wrong way, and that's why we do need you. Right, and that's a very important point. Preemption in any bill about consumer protection or privacy on a federal level is very bad because the standard is not raised up to the highest standard or establish a minimum baseline and let states go above. It literally wipes out any state's ability to enforce existing law or create new law that is in the benefit of their citizens. I just want to say, Nolan, didn't you recommend when we did our transition paper to the Clinton administration oh, that no. they should create a privacy commission? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and and we've worked some with the Canadians on some of these issues. But um, no, all that would be wonderful, but it's, it, it's just ha how do you get there? It's not an easy matter to. Uh, it starts in this room. Yeah. This is where it starts. It starts with you. Um, yeah, and I want to add to your point about the states and what Lily mentioned about preemption. Uh, we, you know, we have the what, what, what can you do slide. Another thing that you can do is, 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 is work on your own state policies because. Uh, uh, states innovate in privacy. They innovate in many key ways. Uh, we now have uh, data breach laws throughout the country. California was the first one to pass this. And up until and once California passed a law that said if you lose people's data, you have to tell them that you've lost their data, that they might be subject to identity theft. People started getting notices. Well, you know, it's not because data breaches just started happening. <laughs> right? They'd been happening. And now that's an issue. Now 44 states have data breach laws. And now, uh, and now the industry, and, and now, and do not track is now being proposed in California as, as part of legislation. Uh, 
And so now with 44 state uh, data breach laws, uh, with California being the strongest, a lot of companies just follow California's because it's easiest for them, and so we all have that great protection. Or uh, they have to follow these 44 different ones, and they go to Congress and they beg for new legislation to wipe these out. Well, that gives, uh, that gives activists leverage. Uh, that gives activists leverage at the federal level. So, um, and the preemption issue is going to be huge because if they pass the preemption, that stops all this experimentation and it kind of freezes our potential to, when new problems come up, uh, develop new legislative solutions. Can I add one little thing? Uh, let me just add one little thing because I should. I, I think that an angle for activists here, um, because they're arguing these are national services, is that the introduction of mobile. Now for the, and, and the, you know, in 2011, and I want the progressives to take advantage of this, but in 2011, $42 billion will be spent in local digital advertising. Each market, right? $42 billion, right? This is, that's what's driving this. And mobile advertising, they're going to be able to target you on your block. They'll know exactly where you are. That's what all the mobile advertising marketing is about. I think it provides new opportunities to raise the privacy and consumer protection issues at the local and state level because they now know where they where you are and they're going after you. Not in, not in state wide, but right here in Massachusetts and Boston. Yeah, and I would add that you have to educate the people you speak to on a routine basis on your web blogs, on the your, the people who take your stories. You have to start bringing them along on this issue of privacy. Um, I cannot overstress the fact that the Federal Trade Commission is actually doing a great thing with the Google agreement on Buzz. Your group brought, they brought to what? Well, well, yeah, <laughs> that's what we're we're Epic is on the front line. We lead with the you know, the tip. we're not looking in s at somebody else's back. When we see something and it violates your privacy, we're going to be, along with Jeff's group, one of the first ones at the door saying, FTC, open up, here's a complaint. <laughs> <laughs> and we stay on the agency about where's the complaint, when are you going to deal with our complaint, when are you going to deal with our complaint, and we will do that for years. It drives them nuts, <laughs> but we do it anyway. And we'll ask them every, every public forum we get them into, we ask them where is that complaint. What we need you to do now is show that the public cares about privacy. That's what the do not call list did for the FTC. It established a, a, a popular support for a constituency for privacy. We need you to help us get people to pay attention to this. Let it be the, your, their, their first introduction to the battle on their privacy rights to participate in this complaint process. And then we'll take a question over here. To take this message out, one of the things that would be very helpful to me would be to have your slideshows uh, available to me as a, a resource. Yeah. Will that be possible? Yeah. Just email us. We'll get it to you. Yeah. 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 Put them on your website, Jeff? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Quick question. Why is Google and Microsoft sponsoring this privacy conference? Oh, that's the one interesting thing about this advocacy conference, Computers, Freedom, and Privacy. It has been around for 21 years. And they, along with other companies, have decided to have a truce day. Well, they all allow advocates, because that's who, makes, who will create the program for this conference. We get a chance to tell them, or tell our stories about what's going on outside and with the privacy tension tensions are, what the privacy issues are. If you look at past CFPs, especially the most recent that have been recorded and live streamed and you can watch the, the panels and presentations, this is not, ex it's not exactly a love fest, but it's not the opportunity to not say what needs to be said. The things we said on this panel would be said at CFP. The important role of CFP is that it's an advocates conference and a conference needs support and funding. And their willingness to support this has been established years ago. And they know what this conference is. So it's not, you know. And Jeff can tell you about it. He's been involved with CFP. He's actually on my plan, uh, uh, program committee as well. But it's an important place where advocates can get together and talk about what's going on and bring the corporate community in as well as policymakers to make sure that our voices are heard. I have to say, Google is a, here's something else that you can do. Google is a good case study uh, to look at in terms of the groups they fund and, uh, you know, the a academic institutions they fund and the fellowship program going to, I wouldn't take a dime of Google money. 
you know, or any, any of the others, but looking, they are the new networks, right? That's it, and they're buying influence all across the board. In this, in this, this, this has a, a, an interesting historical ro yeah, ro ro role, but no question about it, they see this as part of their overall lobbying apparatus, right? Right, and I have to explain, the, the conference is actually Association for Computing Machineries yeah, Conference. So, right, and, and all the funding goes to ACM, and they take care of everything. The chairs change every year. The program committee is dominated by advocates. This is, so yeah, I'm a co-chair. Co co yeah, so, and, and, and while, and, and look what we're, we're doing. Look at, we don't cha change what we're doing because somebody's co-chairing CFP. That's the role of CFP. You bring these voices together who otherwise would not be heard on a broader platform and all the knowledge that we can pull together in order to make sure people understand what's going on. And I'll add that, uh, having been to past conferences, it's not just uh, uh, people who are there but concerned about commercial privacy and, and then the commerce on the other side. There's civil liberties groups, uh, Homeland Security and, and has come out and, and been on panels with ACLU folks. Uh, it's like a, it's a great discussion, and these these companies such as Google and Microsoft, they have their own uh, privacy concerns related to Homeland Security. They want to reform the laws about how the Department of Justice can access your Gmail account, for example, uh, and and uh, on those issues, they're on the side of the Gmail users, at least for that. Uh, so uh, you know, there's 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 many layers here, and we've only just touched on the commercial one. Yeah, lots of questions. All right. Uh, how about uh, in in uh, yeah you you were you were very patient. Uh, I'm sorry behind the red sweater. Oh here. Yeah. Uh, okay, a quickie. It seems you guys have laid out really beautifully how the industry is dominated by the the vendors and advertisers managing the technology. What about Project VRM at Berkman and the possibility that we can take the technology, which is in theory neutral? and turn it around so that it's more controlled by the consumer or by entities that represent the consumer and help the consumer make money with their persona. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, I, I th there's a couple of things about fundamentally how the internet architecture works, the, the routers and the servers, the places where data have to flow. If, it's the, if you have a cable, uh, broadband internet access, their ability to, well, they talked about net neutrality and some of these other issues about packets and managing data flow. If that can be removed and put into the hands of the users, that would be a very interesting situation because that's what we had in the early days of the internet. I mean, let's face it, the, this, the, the, the 90s were like the Wild West, uh, but, you know, and so we were, people were writing their own rules about what would be happening. To be honest, there's another version of Internet Protocol, IPv6. It's called the Internet of Things. That's coming up pretty quickly. That's going to ch change a lot of the things w we say about what's happening in privacy. It's going to make things a lot more complicated. So the more people can get engaged in this discussion and want to be at the table where decisions are being made. This is, to me, it's like revisiting some of the, ru the, the rules of the civil rights movement. You don't want to stay outside the room. Anybody trying to keep you outside the room, you know you need to be in that room, and when you get in the room, you work to get at the table. Right now, you're not even aware there's a room, <laughs> okay? So <laughs> what we're trying to get you to do is get in the room, get at the table, and the only way you're gonna do it is start knocking at the door and saying, I know there's something called NSTIC. I want the, uh, um, the National System for Trusted Identities we need to be a part of that process. You cannot roll out a, a final plan for that because we want a part of the discussion. There's a, a federal register notice out there. The Department of Homeland Security published that because it needs it wants comments. But we're the ones who are gonna tell you about it. They're not gonna be doing a lot of advertising. The only way you're gonna know about it is if you read the federal register, like what Epic does and, and <laughs> Jeff's organization does, and so does Glaramay. So the part of this process is to get people engaged at every level. Yeah, um, and I'll add to that. The one, one key feature of this model that makes me kind of distrustful of, of, of things that, about the consumer taking over like that is that there are massive economies of scale is what's allowing a lot of this to happen. So we're talking about things like 1,000 impressions or 1,000 click-throughs uh, being bought and sold by a couple bucks, for a couple bucks. 
Uh, and so when you think about, like, if you really want to manage the ads that you're getting at that level, how much it's going to cost you and how much we'd ha you'd, you'd have to get paid in order for that to make sense, uh, it's going to be really difficult for users to get involved. Uh, and I think, you know, we, we don't see this in kind of like the product's liability or, or in other products. Like, like, we don't say, you know, if only there was a way for the consumer to figure out uh, what's not going to kill them or what's not going to make them safe, and then they'll make the choices correctly. Uh, no, I mean, we have, like, regulatory structures, and we, and we you know, decide that certain practices aren't going to be done, and, 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 we have, um, and, and we have features like the tort system or, or, or others to, uh, to protect consumers like that. And we don't just kind of uh, rely on, on, on this uh, notion that the consumer is going to go and figure out everything else. Uh, there are tools to help improve uh, consumer choice, uh, but I think ultimately it's, it's putting way too much on consumers to expect them to understand this entire system. Yes, I th no, no, no. I think there is a market. There's a market both on the commercial side and the non-commercial side. Look, and I think progressives really need to take advantage of this, because and and help pioneer this. Not not just in terms of protecting privacy, but figuring out ways to ge to generate revenues and be sustainable in this new digital uh, media marketplace. I do think that the overwhelming dominant system, and I know I sound like um, you know I heard Herb Schiller and all those people, but I do think the overwhelming dominant system, because it's not just the data collection. If we spend more time talking about neural marketing and social, the default they will get you to opt in. They'll they're going to get you. The most powerful forces are, are will get you to give up your identity. But yes, we should create projects that allow people to control their anonymity, and and there's revenues to be made there, and it's it's an imp it's important. We should see more of it. No, I wish we had more time because you're, these questions have been amazing and um, there's lots more to talk about, obviously. But unfortunately, we are out of time. So maybe we can follow up in the, uh, in the um, trade show area. Thank you. Right.